All right, uh, our next speaker is uh, Jess van den Hoever on the future of uh, Open Document. Please go ahead. Thank you for this wonderful applause. I, it's the most applause I've had for setting up the monitor so far. It's, uh, Encouraging. So, well, my first remark this afternoon, I think, would be it's awesome that you're all here, but the room is way too crowded because this topic is very important. Um, we're talking about ODF, and ODF means power. ODF is uh, something which is a tool to spread more freedom for users everywhere because it's a standard format which we, which we would like to have on as many machines as possible and which is essential for... Com um, exchanging data in a, in a free manner. So that's what this talk is going to be about, and let's hope that the room gets even fuller during the talk. A bit about me. I uh, am a civil servant for the Dutch government. I work for the Ministry of the Interior, and there I am tasked, partially, part of my job is to work on the ODF specification. Since 2015, the Dutch government has taken an important interest, more than they did before, in the ODF standards, and they decided they want somebody on the ODFTC to speak on their behalf and make sure that the standard stays stable and stays useful for them and maybe even incorporates new features which are useful for the government. I have quite a history in ODF and uh, in software relating to ODF. Uh, you can see the Web ODF logo over there. Uh, I was in this room five years ago talking about Web ODF, which is an ODF viewer for the browser. It's just JavaScript and it opens your ODF files. Um, I've also worked on Caligua, which is a Qt-based uh, office suite, which is part of the KDE project. Um, those are my two main coding, uh, co coding tasks on ODF. So the Dutch government has set itself a very ambitious goal. They want to do all communication with their citizens digitally from 2017. And that's a big thing. I mean, everybody here is carrying mobile phones, computers, uh, but that's, it, it, it's a novel thing, right? We don't, it's a, only since a decade that people are carrying slightly powerful uh, mobile phones. Um, so, and governments are not always known for being very good at doing software and being digital. So setting this goal is very ambitious. I'm not sure if we're going to make it, but at least we're going to try. Um, there's a big difference, though, between analog and digital. When you were talking with the government analogly, you would have to speak the language of the country, right? So if you knew the dictionary and how to string all the words together, you could talk to somebody from government, the police officer, the judge, uh, the, the person in your municipality, your mayor, but if you do it digitally, somehow there's a lot more protocol involved, right? You have a whole stack of stuff you need to know. TCP, DNS, HTTPS, and that's just the network stuff. And then you go down and SVG, ODF, PDF. It's quite complicated. So how, sure, everybody has a machine which does it for them, but this machine somehow has to be made, right? The software also has to be, be written. And it has to stay stable. It has to be trustworthy in communicating this information with you. So these standards have to be solid. Well, going towards this ambition, there are already quite a few uh, things the government is doing digitally. Uh, one of them is uh, a very popular thing for governments to do these days. It's digital, putting data online, just huge blobs of data about any topic you can imagine. Uh, this is the portal for the Dutch government. Um, so overheid.nl, that means government. And data, well, that's data. So you can search here in a lot of different data sets and get the data as, uh, in, in, in a number of different file formats. Um, the, the licenses are open uh, for all, of most data sets. Uh, I see the total number of data sets, 7,393. Uh, and only two of them are, don't have an open uh, License. So people are encouraged to reuse this data. That's one of the ways in which we communicate. Another way 
uh, is to publish government documents online if your uh, municipality or your province is going to work on a road. Um, they used to publish that in your local newspaper, but these days, at least in the Netherlands, all uh, decentralized parts of government have to publish that in a central website. And on this website, um, you can download these documents in a number of formats. Now, unfortunately, the icon for the formats has dropped off the screen here, but you can still see the names. I hope you can read them. It says ODT format, XML format, and PDF format. So this document is a uh, text from a discussion in our parliament, and it's available in these formats. Um, I give you a slight view into how we create those, and here you can see the icons better, so it's a bit more obvious what the file formats are. So internally, we create all these documents in a government-specific XML format. It's specific for the Netherlands at the moment, but we're looking into uh, adopting international standards for that. That is the file format with the highest information. We also convert it to PDF. That's nice. It's a fixed layout. If you want to print it, it looks good. Uh, and it's a mature format. We also support XHTML because that's easy to view in the browser. And lastly, we publish the documents as ODT because that's the best format for you to reuse parts of the document. If you want to copy and paste into a different document, that's the best format to use. So these are just three standards, and uh, the government should be, using, should be using standards. It has to make a list of what are the best standards, and we have a website for that as well. This is the website for the standardization on standards within the Dutch government. Um, you can get the list as CSV or ODS, so they're using their own standards. Both of these standards are on this list. Uh, the list is very long, so it doesn't fit on the screen, but it has a search function. And so it looks like uh, the policy is very good, right? We're creating thousands of documents every day in standard formats. Um, and we have this whole list of files, formats to use. But if you look at how they are actually used in smaller, less centralized uh, areas of the government, then the numbers can look less good. And that's what the next slide is about. And the reason, well, I'll talk, come into the reason a bit later. So here are some numbers from a report which will be published in a few days, which is doing something very simple. Uh, what's being done is just look uh, two websites, in this case from, from cities and from provinces, and count how many instances of each file type are available on the website. Uh, and you can see that, well, it's done for three years, uh, that ODT has zero in nearly all columns. But dot doc does have significant numbers. So these are parts of government which still have to uh, comply to the policy. They, they're not following the, the national policy yet. Uh, here's another graph um, showing uh, the ratio between uh, use of ODT and DOC. And um, you can see that uh, there's only one column in the summer of 2014 where the ratio for ODT over the DOC was higher than zero, which is good. Right? That means there's more ODT than uh, dot dot. But then, for some reason, it deteriorated again the year after. I don't know why this is. I haven't, I haven't looked into that yet. Suffice to say, uh, it's, the adoption is not optimal. Here's another graph, and this is showing what people are requiring in their procurement. If a government needs a bit of software, they have to make a procurement, and in this procurement they have to say, I want this software to follow these and these standards. And the policy is that they should ask for standards. So this lists how many of the tenders actually list the right standards? And you can see that for ODF 1.2, which is a version of ODF the Dutch government uh, follows, only 90% of the relevant tenders actually mention this number. So this is something that also can be improved. The reason why these numbers are relatively low is partially because the policy does not have... Uh, um, the, the, if you don't comply with the policy, you, there, there's no consequence to it. So it's just goodwill from the different parts of government at the moment. So maybe we should be a bit stricter in that sense. Now, um, there's, here's another website which allows you to search 
for municipalities to see what software packages they are using. Um, so you can see which, um, if, if the software packages your municipality is using, it's using ODF. And if you do a search, there are 16 available government related software packages which, uh, which do ODF at the moment. Okay, let's go to a different country. The UK. UK, the UK is doing very well with open standards. They had, uh, one and a half years ago, two, well, two years ago actually, they made a call to ask the people in England, in the UK, sorry, what standards do you think is more, are more important? Uh, what should we as a government uh, standardize on? There was a lot of feedback, and most of it was very, very positive that the government should be using ODF. So that's what they did. Um, this is the proposal they wrote, and um, yeah, well, I'm not going to link on this one, but um, this is the actual guidance for the UK government to use ODF. So this is a document which was written to help all the civil servants to learn how to uh, deal with ODF. And what I very much like about this document is that at the bottom it's tells explicitly the reasons for using ODF in just a couple of bullet points. It says, we use ODF 1.2 because it allows citizens, businesses, and other organizations to share and edit documents with government and the other way around. It allows people working in government to share and edit documents with each other. It's very simple language. It's very good. And it's a reliable, long-term solution for storing and accessing information and is compatible with a wide range of software. Very good reasons. It's basically boiled down this very long discussion they had with their, with their citizens about what to use. And, uh, well, this document was last updated the 11th of September and they are really making good progress in actually implementing this. Um, the, the people who are responsible for steering all of government to, towards this are in the cabinet office and that's just below the prime minister. So they have the right force to be able to make this happen. And it's necessary, because if you look across the EU, uh, adoption of ODF could really improve. Um, there was a, a campaign, Fix My Documents, which was about uh, just counting how many ODF documents are used within Europe. And if you look at those numbers, you see that it's also not great, right? You see two huge columns for .doc and .pdf, but uh, ODS is almost empty, ODP is completely empty, and ODT is quite pitiful, right? So, uh, and only within the European Commission. So the European Parliament and the Council of the EU, they are not using this excellent file format. So I think we should tell them more forcefully what the advantages of this format are, and what the potential savings are, and what the uh, long-term storage uh, uh, improvements of this file format are. But there's also good news. There was a talk in the, uh, by Italo Vignoli uh, yesterday that the English army is switching to LibreOffice and is standardizing on the ODF file format. They, um, because of the heavy equipment they use, have certain security related uh, requirements and that was part of the reason why they chose ODF. Um, the Libre Italia Association is very active in uh, getting, getting people to switch to ODF. They're doing an excellent job and this is a great success for them. And if you look outside of Europe, there are also highlights. The current status in Taiwan is very good. ODF became, becomes the national standard format and it becomes a national policy to use ODF to make documents. This is great news, right? And they're aiming to fully migrate to ODF and LibreOffice in 2017. That's great. Um, by the way, you may notice that this is a different themed slide because I stole it from the person who was reporting on this at the uh, LibreOffice conference uh, last autumn. And he actually encouraged people, because this was his last slide, tell the world, Taiwan is migrating to ODF. Now. So that's very good. And I hope they succeed. But there's still a lot to do. Many people just don't know what's so urgent about using ODF as a file format. 
And that's why there are, uh, uh, are promotion materials being made, right? This is uh, a lot, um, in this autumn we had a meeting of ODF experts in the Netherlands, and uh, this was a document which was handed out, and I have copies of it over here. The copies and this version are in Dutch, but we have translations in many languages. If you would like to download a version of this awesome graphic, then you can go to the website of Open Forum Europe and uh, look for it. If you can't find it, you can email me and I will, I will uh, help you find it, because I'm not sure it's, a very, easy, it's very easy to find. Um, but it's, an, uh, it's a very nice graphic, and it just explains in simple terms what the advantages of the format are. Right? You get rid of uh, lock-in. Um, you can uh, what does it say? Right. You can change. You can set, change your software provider because you have an open standard. So yeah, these these are advantages ex uh, explained in layman's terms in this nice info infographic. Another example which I think will help. Uh, the adoption of ODF is the Document Liberation Project. Um, I guess not many people here know about this project. Can I see a number of hands who have heard of this? One, yes, of course. <laughs> okay, well, let's say 10 maybe, yeah? Uh, what is so awesome about the Document Liberation Project? They take old files for which the software has long been outdated and can't run on modern systems anymore, they look at all the binary details of this file format, and then they write a translator to make it translate to ODF. And why did they choose ODF? Because ODF basically has so many features that you can translate almost anything into ODF. Uh, and, of course, it's a stable open standard with very good support in a, num uh, a wide range of software. Um, the, yeah, the, the inner workings of ODF. Has anybody ever looked here inside of an ODF file? Ah, that's much more already. Okay, very good. Yeah, so about half the people here know that ODF file is basically a zip file, right? And in the zip file, there are XML files. Um, there's styling involved, and the styling in HTML is done with CSS, but in ODF, it's done with ODF styles. And ODF styles, they derive from CSS, so all the statements, like saying this font, should, this font should be bold or the alignment should be left or right, that's all taken from CSS. But what's added on top is to have named styles and automatic styles that can be applied to parts of the document. So it adds something on top of CSS to make it easy to work with CSS type of styling in Office documents. And for images, we use PNG back and SVG, just like uh, HTML does. The only thing which is not part of the ODF standard is uh, to define a scripting language. There are uh, a lot of points in the document format where you can say this is a point where a scripting language could tie in, but the language itself is not standardized. So your office suite may offer a number of languages to do your scripting in. You're not limited to just one. But there's a big advantage to ODF compared to HTML. And that is, again, this zip container. Everything is in one file. If you get an HTML file from the web and you, you check out what service it's reading all the files from, it can be 10 different servers. So if you try to store your document for later use, that's quite a challenge. Um, sure, you can, browsers offer the possibility to download it, but a lot of the materials which are included are dynamic these days. And with ODF, you're 99% guaranteed that whatever is in your document is simply in a zip file. Sometimes people will put a link to get document information externally, but the common way of using it is to put everything in the same zip container. And that's very good for people that want to read their document in 10 years' time. The website would have been long gone, but the file and all the stuff that's needed to render it is still available. Yeah, so ODF has come a long way. It's existed officially since 2005, but uh, work on ODF started in 2001, so it took about four years to get to the first version. Uh, it didn't just come out of nothing. Um, and the first version was very, very complete already. 1.1 uh, just added small things, made some small fixes. Uh, and then 1.2 was a big bang because a lot of stuff came in again. At that point, 
We added RDF support, which means semantic information can be added to your documents. And a very important addition was to standardize the formulas in your spreadsheets. In ODF 1.1 and 1.0, uh, there was no time uh, to actually write down what the formulas mean and what, the, what all the formulas do, all the functions in the formulas. And it was, this was added in 1.2. So from 1.2 on, it's a very, very complete and nice spec. Another very good addition in 1.2 was the addition of uh, signing your documents. So now you can digitally sign your document uh, so that you can see, ah, this document was really created by person X. That's, by the way, something that at the government we're not yet doing. I'm, 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 uh, I would like to see that we uh, sign our documents so that if I download a file from the government website and I send it to somebody that they can see that it's not a file I created, but it was really uh, from the person that uh, you can really see that it was really an official document. Yes, o um, o ODF is standardized at Oasis. There, that's where we do all our work. But we also push the standard to ISO, and there it gets another blessing. And that blessing can take quite long. You see that for ODF 1.2, it took uh, slightly less than four years to finally get approved, but this year it finally happened. So if you are in a place where you need to have only ISO standards, you can now also use ODF 1.2. How do we create the standard? Is it like sausage, where you uh, don't really want to see what goes in now? It's actually a very open process. Part of this list of standards which we have in the Dutch government, uh, the requirements for that list is that it's a very open process and anybody can join and there are no patent uh, royalties to be paid for the standards. And these are also the, the, the guidelines for the work that's being done at OASIS. So, yeah, uh, OASIS has a number of different other standards. Uh, for example, legal XML, which is a standard for writing uh, laws in XML. Um, we have a phone conference once a week and what we do there is we apply to comments on the mailing list. If you have an issue with ODF, you can mail us. Um, and we discuss issues in the issue tracker. What we are currently very busy with is uh, getting through our backlog. We have neglected uh, quite a few issues for a while and we are now doing a lot of churn through all the issues. So if you look at uh, our issue tracker, uh, which is also open, and you can find it uh, via uh, the ODF website. You can see that we are discussing which issues to put into the next version 1.3 and which issues we're going to postpone until a later version. And then we, when we accept the change, we change the, the specification. And since this year, we uh, upgraded our process. Instead of just putting it in files in uh, folders, we're actually using SVN now. So Oasis doesn't have Git, unfortunately, so we're using SVN, but it works fine. For a spec specification, it's good enough. Yeah, these, these are the members of the TC at the moment. These are the people that write the spec. It's nice to know who, who they are, um, to know who's involved. You can see that there are four individuals, so people who just think it's an important standard, and that's why they join. Uh, there's one person from Microsoft, there's no person from IBM anymore, unfortunately. Uh, they stopped contributing. Of course, they took an interest in ODF when they uh, require, acquired the, or when they decided to work. Well, they always have had an interest in ODF because of the Symphony Suite, but they also took uh, stewardship together with the, in the Apache Foundation of Open Office, but they're pulling out of that now. So there's nobody from um, IBM anymore in the TC, but we have somebody from Multiratio, which is a Hungarian company that makes a version of uh, OpenOffice, LibreOffice, this, that code base. Well, the code base with that root is, of course, split. Um, somebody from the Document Foundation, somebody from CIB Labs, which is a, a company in Munich, which does ODF uh, LibreOffice support, somebody from Red Hat, well, the Dutch government. Uh, yeah, that's it. There used to be somebody from KDE, but he went to the Dutch government. So. Okay. Now, how can we improve ODF for normal people? Um, 
we have this standard to improve interoperability. That means if I send you a file, you can open it, edit it, send it back to me, and we will have the same file. We will see the same things. And that means that all the software has to implement the standard correctly, right? But from experience, I'm sure you all know that if, even if you have a different version of a particular office suite, things can still go wrong. You might miss information. And so this, these errors here of document flow, they probably make everybody cringe because even though we want to have interoperability, it's not super smooth all the time. So how can we improve that? Well, first of all, we have to convince the people who write the software to join the standardization process. And actually, we've seen in the past that there are many incentives to not standardize, right? If you control the file format or if you control the extensions that you save, then you have a position where your user is captured, right? So there are incentives for not standardizing, which is why we should applaud the companies that do, even though they might be pressured to do so. But if they finally do, that, that's a great thing. Um, and that helps us come to a point where we can say software is not the file format, right? Everybody used to, still many people think that, right? I send you a Word file. Sorry, what? Could you please send me an ODF file? I don't know what a, a word for, is that the binary? People don't understand what the difference is, right? And that's, this is an important education point, a very tough one. I mean, um, yeah, if somebody could come up with a nice fairy tale to explain people, or a nice simile to explain the difference between software and file format that works every time, that would be a big feat. Um, there's members of my family who have been explaining the, this to for a long time, but they still don't get it. So it's, it's tough to, 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 to learn people about this. Um, but if we learn people in control, so people at large organizations about this, and they understand it, that will, can, can really help speed up the adoption. Another thing is that I would like editors of ODF to be gentle. Uh, what I mean by that is that when they open this zip file and they open the XML inside it, what they often do is they translate that into their internal memory model and save that back as a different, well, it's still ODF, but it has different conventions in there, right? Maybe they have a different name scheme for naming the automatic styles, or maybe they will prefer one type of element over the other when they have similar functionality. And I think software shouldn't do that. It should just take the XML as it is, and when I type in a paragraph, just add the characters there. Now, this is a bit into the future, on the one hand, on, for the established Office suites, LibreOffice, Microsoft Office, Google Docs, they don't work in this way. And it won't be easy to make them work in that way. But it would be good if they went in that direction. I know of two Office suites software that, that do this, and that's OX Documents which is uh, a cloud-based solution. And what they do is they have a document, and then they just send operations to the document. So on the server, they store the actual ODT, and then they stack the changes to the document on top of that. So you always have the original document and just a minimal set of changes to your document. So the, if they don't understand something, for example, that graph you see there, they may not, their software may not understand it, but they don't touch it. They just leave it alone. and. They, they can render it. ODF tells you that if you have a sort of fancy object in your file, you should also put an image next to it. So that even if I can't render the fancy object, I can still render the, the SVG or the PNG, which is next to it. So yeah, the Web ODF and OX documents are the only ones at the moment which do this, but I encourage anybody who would like to uh, start programming ODF software to take this approach. Oh, duplicate slides. Uh oh. Ah. I'm not sure if this was the next slide. I don't think it is actually. Maybe it'll just kill the So 
Sorry about that. This is a laptop I borrowed because my laptop only has HDMI and uh, I don't know, maybe this one is a bit slower or Evince is having a hard time rendering all the slides. So while I'm, I'm finding the right slide, I can uh, tell you about what the next slide was going to be. And that's to say that um, what you should also do is instead of as long as we don't have office suites which are, which are gentle to the ODF files, we should do testing. And, um, ah, exciting point. Yes. Okay, I didn't show this one before, but here you can see that uh, the styles. Ah, oh, no, it's showing. I'll just skip this one. We need gentle editors, but we also need testing. So, what we have done in the last. Uh, in you know, six years or so, is to have plug fests. And a plug fest is where implementers of ODF software come together, they sit in a room, and they test all their implementations to see if they work in the same way. We had the 11th plug fest in The Hague in last September, um, so we already had 11 of them, uh, which is a lot. You can see we tour all of Europe. Um, we haven't toured out of Europe yet, but uh, that might be in the pipeline. Maybe we will go to Taiwan in the future. Uh, that would be nice. Um, yeah. This was a picture from the first Plugfest, which was also in The Hague. And this is a picture of the 11th Plugfest. And, well, nothing changed, really. People got a bit more gray. Some people got exchanged. Uh, yeah. So how does it work? How do we go about testing? Um, we come together in one location with your laptop. You go to this website, which is a wiki. And there we have scenarios. For example, we have a scenario for creating a spreadsheet with a graph. You create the spreadsheet with a graph, then you save the file to the wiki, and somebody opens it in a different office suite. And he looks to see, hey, is this a spreadsheet with a graph? OK, what are the values in the graph? What are the colors? Is it correct? OK, is it not correct? And then you analyze the results and write them in the wiki. Well, you see, you see, saw that we've done it 11 times already, and on one day we can maybe do eight scenarios, if we're lucky, after setting up the laptop. So that's not really going to give us a lot of coverage for a standard which has hundreds of elements. So we improved this uh, way of working, and uh, the Plugfest we had in London, the one before The Hague, what we did there is we uh, wrote tests and then ran them automatically. So we went through the specification and wrote small snippets of XML, which we wrapped into an ODF document. We scripted all of that so people didn't have to do that. And then we collected the results onto an HTML page. All of this was done before the actual plug fest. So the results could be read by the people coming to the plug fest and they could discuss what, what, which office suite was, was doing it wrong and which one was doing it right. Or maybe the test was wrong. And then we collect all of these results in a report. Here's an example of such a test. So it's a simple text test. Uh, it basically says, hello. And um, that's the input. And then the output has to be an ODT in one of the versions. And the file content XML in this file has to still have one paragraph. And we count that automatically by writing an X path expression there. So you have an X path, and that's the slash slash O column text, text column P. So one paragraph, that count should be one. If that's not one, then something went wrong in loading and saving of that document. This simple type of test, we have now hundreds of these. And uh, so at the last platform, we run them, and each test results into a page like this. So you see red and green colors. That's user universal code for good and wrong. Right? Some are true, some are false. The first line has the validation errors. Those are easy because, well, every document has to be valid. So we test every document which we save to see if it's valid. It's valid. I don't know if you can read the, the headings here, 
But uh, the first red column is Google Docs. The one next to it is Abbey Word. Um, then WebODF and LibreOffice are green, and Microsoft is red again. So not everybody is validating all the time. Then the second line, um, the label is a bit incomprehensible. And that's a usability issue in the test interface. Uh, but basically what this test does is test if, if you have a wave through your text, if, you, if the line is a wave, if that's actually uh, retained in the document. At the bottom, you can see what the, what the screenshot of the implementation shows. And you can see that Caligra is the only one showing a wave. I took a particularly nasty test, uh, one for which many uh, office suites failed. You can see that Google Docs just doesn't even have the line. And the two red blocks above indicate that it's I even losing the information that there should be a line through. So not only does it not render it, it's actually losing the information. So your document is less good after going through Google Docs. And the same is true for every word. Then with WebODF and LibreOffice, it's a mixed story. WebODF comes through nicely, but it, that's because it's a gentle editor and doesn't touch the XML. LibreOffice does retain the fact that there should be a line, and in the reading, rendering, you can see there's a line. By the way, WebODF retains the information, but it doesn't show the line. But it doesn't, LibreOffice doesn't retain the fact that there's a wiggly line, and neither does Microsoft. So this is a point where we can improve. Now, having hundreds of these tests, we managed to go through a lot of them on, at the last Plugfest, and we, we counted them all up. First, we wrote per box, we, 10 more minutes. Oh, that's, that fits perfectly. Um, per uh, test, we wrote down, OK, Google Docs has a bug, AB Word has a bug, WebODF has a bug. And then in the end, we counted all of that up. And then we saw these numbers. These are actual numbers where the implementers looked at it and said, yes, these are real numbers, and we have to go and fix them. Um, but it's only for one area. We only looked at text rendering at this plug first. So even though we managed to really a lot of tests, we didn't get through all of the specification. So it's still not fast enough. We still need to level up once more to do more testing. How are we going to do that? Well. Um, Ideally, we'd like to come to a situation where we have something like the acid test. The, the acid test is, uh, this was hip in 2005, right? When uh, browsers were really, really sucky, and somebody came up with a bit of HTML, which was so crazy that if you showed it in the browser, it looked like a smiley face. Well, Internet Explorer 6 shows just a big red block, as does Internet Explorer 7. Well, Opera 8 isn't much better. It's quite horrible, right? Um, with ODF, we are not in a situation as bad as this, but we do want to improve. And we, we also want to get to a state where we have a smiley face, and we can we get, say that 100 out of 100 passes for most of the office suites. But then we first have to make sure that we have to test for all of that. And what we would also like is to make it easier for implementers of ODF to find information about what a particular office suite supports. We saw in a previous test that if you want a wavy line and you're sending it to somebody with uh, Google Docs, that he won't see the line at all, right? So can we, can we provide users uh, with this information? Can we make a website where you just drag your file on top of it and it will tell you this file will look OK in these office suites? And this is why. And these are the links to the bug reports about them. That's what we're building right now. And that's what this slide is all about. Um, so we made a design. As you can see, it's very pretty. It's actually almost unreadable. I had, uh, after we made this, after with some, uh, well, we felt, we felt very proud of ourselves that we made this wonderful workflow of doing all the testing. And then when I came home and I tried to decrypt it, it took some time. But I managed, and now we're busy implementing uh, a website where people can go to and upload ODF documents see what they look like in the different office suites, and if there's something wrong, isolate what the problem is with an XML editor inside. So at that point, you need a bit of expertise, or you just label the document, can an expert look at this? And then we isolate the test case, give it a name, add a commenting function so people from different implementations can talk about what's going wrong, if maybe the, in the, the specification itself is unclear, uh, or 
if it's just an obvious error in a particular uh, office suite. And that way, I hope that we can accelerate uh, that all the office suites come to a common understanding of how to show you an ODF file. And this site should have a scoreboard. That would be the most awesome thing, right? So th that you, you come there and you say, what is, which office suite is in the lead today of being the best at rendering ODF documents or editing ODF documents? Um, these numbers are real, but the names are, are removed just to avoid. Uh, the, the numbers are from the previous one. They're only about the text. Uh, so I, I, I removed the, the office suite names to avoid this ending up on a blog somewhere because it's just part of the ODF specification which we've been testing. But we would like to have a picture for the whole ODF specification like this based on actual data where you can drill down and show data about the text or the formulas or the graphs or the images uh, or the presentations. That's the, that's the next step. Yeah. So that's the future of ODF. Um, but the future of ODF is also you in the audience. Because your computer users, everybody here is writing Office documents. I hope you're all using ODF. I'm not going to ask. I just trust that you do. Uh, I also hope that you help spread the word about ODF and talk to your government, talk to your company that they really should use the standard. And if you can, write ODF software. It's awesome. It's a lot of fun. Uh, and if you want to test it, that's also great. We ho hope to have this testing server up this year, which will streamline the testing process. But we will also continue having the PlugFest. So if you're interested in coming to a PlugFest, you can also do that. That's it. Other questions? I can repeat the question if you want. Yeah. Hi, so you say the open document formats, the specification, the specification says uh, only accepted image formats are PNG and GP, JPEG. And as far as I remember, in the open document format specifications, there was no such restriction. So this allowed uh, OpenOffice and LibreOffice to use their own proprietary image format as replacement for graphics and so on. Has it changed recently, or is just that uh, a tiny mist mistake? Yes. Um, so the specification encourages you to use PNG and SVG as images. JPEG is also fine, of course. And you're, you're, you're asking, is uh, our OpenOffice and LibreOffice still saving to their own vector graphics format in, when they're saving, right? Well, uh, this presentation was created with LibreOffice 5.0, and it has the SVGs which I put in there. So I, I looked inside the zip file, and it just had the normal SVGs. So at least in LibreOffice 5, it's fine. I know it's also fine in Caligua. It's also fine in WebODF. I'm not sure about if, I don't think OpenOffice changed it. So they're probably still right to the SVM format, which is proprietary, as you say. Yeah. Are there any other questions? No? All right, well, thank you very much for your talk.